So let's go, we're in paragraph um, chapter 26. Matt covered paragraphs one through three. I'm gonna do a quick review of that and then let's push forward. We're gonna try to cover paragraphs four through six. By way of introduction, paragraph one, if you look at paragraph one, it was, the theme was the universal church, the invisible church. These are the elect of God, okay? Um, it is all that the Father has elected in time. He has changed them, and he indwells them with his spirit. And so I want to go to John 17, I think, Matt referenced this last week. This is the high priestly prayer. The true church, the, the, the real church of God, are those that are indwelt by God. It's not Israel. It's not a building. It's not a location. It's not a religious order. It's not an institution. These are those whom God has chosen before time began. So if you're in John 17, starting verse 6, I'll translate the old English of mine. The Lord Jesus Christ is praying. I, that's Christ speaking, manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. Christ is praying to the Father for those that he has given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 9, I ask on their behalf, these that you've given me. I do not ask on behalf of the world. There is no universal atonement. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but those whom you gave me for they are yours. Verse 21, uh, verse 20. He's praying for the 11, effectively, and all those that have been following him, all the, all the people in the ministry that have believed in him. And then he looks to the future in verse 20. He looks to us. He's looking at us and even the future. I do not ask in, on, in behalf of these alone, but for those also who will believe in me through their word. These were to be the generations to come. Their word, who did the Lord use to write the New Testament? He used the apostles. So that's, that's the sense in and how from, from the day of Pentecost on, that they, verse 21, may all be one, even as you, Father, art in me and I in thee. So that's, that, is, that is the church, okay? Um, the church uh, he is the, literally the word means called out ones, ecclesia. And I said this, and I think this is so important, and this is where we go, we get, th this whole chapter is so important because we've gone so far astray in the general church that meets in this country, and what the church is, who, who the members of the church really are, and I said it earlier, the believer, the church is made up of believers that are called out by God and indwelt by God. Romans 8. Turn with me to Romans 8, verse 5. God has chosen a people for himself. He has indwelt this people with his spirit. This is the true church. This is the invisible church. This is the universal church. Verse 5. Romans 8, 5, Paul is writing a contrast between the believer and the unbeliever. The, the believer is the one that is according to the Spirit, 
The unbeliever is according to the flesh. And so he says in verse 5, For those who are are, are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Real clear. However, here's the contrast. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's the believer. The believer is the one who has been born again and has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The question that is is asked over and over again when somebody first is shown this doctrine of election is, is how do I know if I'm one of the elect? What do the elect do? They believe. They're the only ones that can truly believe. That's what the elect do. Do you believe? Paragraph two, it's the local church. It's the visible church. It's the visible saints. It's those that outwardly profess the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe in Him. They seek to be obedient to Him. This is Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. This is the church visible. It's the church that professes belief. Our lives, error, false doctrine can void our profession, but that is the visible. That's what we see. That's we, we, when somebody comes and, and applies for membership, we take their word at face value when they say that they believe. Marilyn and I years ago went to a church, and the preacher used two words, and to paraphrase him, he would, he would, he would say, you profess, but do you pr- possess? You possess profess Christ, but do you possess Christ? That's the question. Um, 2 Timothy 2. We look around to the left and to the right, and we will say, they're a believer. It's a little bit of a slippery slope. We can't see the heart. The Lord knows the heart. Um, There will many, those will come to him and say, did we not cast out demons? Did we not this and that in your name? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't know you. 2 Timothy 2.19 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. The Lord is not confused on who's in His church. He's the Lord of salvation. He's the one that planned it before time began. He's the one that elected them. He's the one that called them. He's the one that changed them. He's the one that sanctifies them. And he is the one that one day will glorify them. The Lord knows who his people are. And that should be a great comfort to you and I. Paragraph 3. The church is not perfect. Matt said it last week, if you find a perfect church, don't go there because you'll mess it up. The church isn't perfect because the church is made up of people that are not perfect. The Lord Jesus Christ 
has always had his people in the world. Now, when we say that the church isn't perfect, it's obvious if you look at your soul and look at your life, come talk to me afterwards if you have reached sinless perfection. Maybe we can work on that. <laughs> but we're, we're sinners. We're terrible sinners. Uh, Tommy Nelson, when he would teach, he famously said, if you knew what was in my heart, you wouldn't be here. And if we knew what was in your heart, we wouldn't let you in the building. So, but the believer not being perfect has a different character, has a new nature, is qualitatively different than the world. And, it, and it's probably easiest, easiest seen in the fruits of the Spirit. I, I said it earlier, the believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's God's salvation. That's not debatable. So if you're indwelt by the Spirit, what's the result of that? It's fruit from the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It was interesting last week when Lawson was teaching in Genesis 23, he was, he was teaching about... Abraham, Abraham was rich, Sarah has died, and he humbles himself before the sons of Seth. And so, the, 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 he kept building in that narrative about Abraham's humility. He kept bowing to the ground. He paid the full price for the cave and the land. He, he didn't even address the man directly because he was humble. He's a believer. That's one of the marks of being a believer. If you're in the one-year Bible and you've been reading, turn back to, turn back to, to Numbers. It's so encouraging when you meet a believer, bless you, you meet a believer that everybody knows, and you meet them, and they're not self-centered, they're not reading their own press clippings, and they're humble. It's so encouraging. We, after, before we started this church, not to get sideways on this, uh, we were going to Countryside. Countryside's a wonderful church. And providentially, I sat next to Tom Pennington's wife. My, my wife had been there, and then I was gone, and I think his wife's name is Sheila. And um, Marilyn sat. We started talking, told her what we were planning on doing. And she, you know, if you've been to Countryside, it's a big church. I'm not going to be a member at Countryside. And she goes, you need to call my husband, Tom. That's nice, da, da, da. A couple weeks later, I see her, Have, did you call my husband, Tom? And I'm sure that my wife exhorted me after many more weeks to call Tom. And I called Tom, and his secretary answers the phone. She puts me through, and he says, I've been expecting your call. I'm like, who am I? Why, why are you expecting my... He went to lunch. He opened up any resource we wanted, and it, the humility was just amazing. Here's this man that has this huge church the Lord has raised up, and he is humble in spirit because he knows it's all of God. That, that's how, that should be the mark of every believer. Numbers chapter 12. Verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman 
whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Here's the point. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. The Lord raised Moses up. He grew him up in Pharaoh's household. He taught him how to shepherd for 40 years, and then he led Israel out of Egypt at the hand of Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. The Apostle Paul, over and over again, I'm the least amongst the saints. Ephesians 3, 7 and 8, time fails, but, you know, said that he wasn't, his letters were strong, but his appearance was weak. He was a humble man. He considered himself least of the apostles and least of a believer because he had persecuted the church of God. That should be the mark of a believer. Your salvation and my salvation has everything to do with God, and we are the recipients of it. And there should be no pride for the believer except in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paragraph 4, that's the review. Paragraph 4, the first six, seven words is the key to the paragraph. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church in whom by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner, and you could add in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, this document was written as a product of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, John Calvin, they were in the Church of Rome. That was the only church that existed. And coming out of the Reformation, and the Pope has no position before God. And I'm not defending the Pope. The language in the confession is very sharp against Roman Catholicism and anything that is not biblical because that was the pressing issue of the Protestant Reformation. And so you see it in the paragraph. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, starting in verse 13. Colossians 1, 13. For he, the Father, God the Father, for he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred to the, us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The subject now goes from the Father to his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to verse 17. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, is head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything, that he might have preeminence in everything. The reason we're here is, is that 
the Lord Jesus Christ is head of his body, his bride, the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that has done everything for his people, which consists of the church. Go to Matthew chapter 28. The very end. This is the, what often is called the Great Commission. Verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. By whom? By the Father. All authority has been given to me by the Father in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son, i.e. my name and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am, al- I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Lord Jesus Christ has preeminence in the church. He is the head of the church. He has made all provision. He has been given authority by God over everything in the church. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 10. He who descended is himself also he who has ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. The he, the subject of that sentence, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave some as apostles, as some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ. He's given these offices. He's, he's, he is given to men for the edification, for the building up of the body. Okay? He, this is for verse 12, is what the church should do. Equipping the saints, i.e., in your margin, it'll say holy ones. God has made his people holy positionally holy. He's making them holy through progressive sanctification for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Okay? Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 2. Let's start in verse 1. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Now we, requ- now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a measure or a letter as if it is from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. They were confused on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let, verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, the man of lawlessness. This is the Antichrist. The man of lawlessness is revealed in the sons and the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, 
so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was teaching you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who he now only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Now, that's the Antichrist. The writers of the Confession consider the Pope of Rome, the head of the Church of Rome, Roman Catholicism, to be in the spirit of the Antichrist. Not the actual Antichrist, but in the spirit of him. Okay? Paragraph four. This is, I'm sorry, paragraph five. This is so important. There, I hate this version of the, the hate, maybe hate's so strong. I dislike this version of paragraph five because the he and the his and the him are not capitalized. I went through and capitalized all 11 pronouns that refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paragraph five reads, in the execution of this power, one of the versions says authority, wherein he, capital H, is so entrusted, the Lord Jesus calls out of the world unto himself, capital H, through the ministry of his word, capital H, and by his spirit, capital H, those that are given unto him by his father. There's a lot right there. The Lord Jesus Christ calls out of the world unto himself through the ministry of his word and his spirit, those that are given unto him by his father. If we, if we get nothing else, that's what we need to get. That they may walk before him in all the ways of obedience which he prescribes to them in his word. The, those thus called he commands to walk together in particular societies or churches for their mutual edification and the due performance of that public worship which he requires of them in the world. Okay, let's go to John 10. This is, this is so important. It's not terribly deep, but it's not always understood. The Good Shepherd, John 10, verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own. That word there for know means he knows them intimately. He knows their heart. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, it said, Adam knew Eve, and she bore and con conceived and bore a son. Th this is knowing somebody as only God can know his people. I'm the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my sheep, my life for the sheep. Go down to verse 26. It's a running dialogue. They don't believe in him. Verse 26. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. There's that word again. 
and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Now go back to verse 16. This is you and I. This is the church. These are those that would come after. These are the Gentiles. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold. They're not Jewish. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. That's the church. That is the church. And the Lord Jesus Christ knew from the very beginning that he just didn't come to Israel, but he came to Israel first. Go back to Genesis 12. Abram, in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That was God's intent from the very beginning. Go to John chapter 12. Verse 32. We have this part of this theme here. The Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the cross. He says in verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He's going to draw his men to himself from every tribe, tongue, nation, all types of people, he's going to draw all types of men without exception to himself. He's talking about the cross, verse 33, but he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. We, the church is established through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the payment for his people. Go back to Matthew. Matthew 18. Starting in verse 15. Matthew 18. And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that the, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as to you a Gentile or a tax collector, gatherer. Truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. That's the church. That's, that's, that's us coming together. That's, there's so much in here. There's church discipline. There, there's one, one voice shouldn't be heard. It's calling them into the church to be reconciled to the church. But ultimately, where God's people gather, two or three or more, and they earnestly seek the Lord, he says, I am in their midst. So, this is what the church misses. Go to Romans 10. This is what the modern evangelical church misses. How does the Lord 
establish his church. What does he say? It's through the ministry of his word. Why do we, why is, why do we seek to make the word of God central to everything that we do at this church? Because it is the means that God has given. It's the means of salvation. We are to be people of the word. Look what the paragraph says. The Lord Jesus calls out of the world sinners unto himself through the ministry of his word. When the word is preached, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and lives are changed. But the power is in God's word. Verse 12, Romans 10, 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. Steve Lawson uses verse 13 often at the end of a sermon. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he gives us, how is that going to happen? And it's this reverse chain. Verse 14, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? The ones that will be saved are the ones that are calling on the Lord in faith, by faith. And he says, well, how shall they call upon him, Christ, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? He's giving us the logistics of how the ministry of the word works in reverse. I said it earlier, months ago, people will go, okay, well, what about one of the tribes along this river in some remote part of the world. If that is the Lord's person, what will he do? He will establish a divine appointment. He will put it in somebody's heart to become a missionary. He will teach that person. They'll get on a train, a plane, a boat, and they will go there. They will speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, whom this person has never heard. And the Lord, through his word and his spirit, will change their heart, and they will believe. And you go, wow, that seems like a lot of work. Well, it is, it's only the work that God can do. And I said this also, but what's different about your neighbor who lives in Plano? Unless the Lord opens the heart, unless he gives a divine appointment, unless he puts his word in somebody's mouth, unless he accompanies his word with his spirit, this person won't believe. I don't care if they're in Africa or they're in Dallas. It's the same miracle of life and regeneration. It's the same operation of circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit. That's how God saves his people. Verse 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. That's the gospel. Verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Matt said it last week. We have a friend, very good friend of his, who said, who has said, and it's not his statement, what you win them with is what you win them to. You build a castle playland, and everybody's there because their kids are there. Castle playland is good. It's not a bad thing. Starbucks coffee, Krispy Kreme donuts, what you win them with is what you win them to. We want to win people to the Word of God because that's what we're winning them to. Does that make sense? What you win them with is what you win them to. Go to Romans chapter 2. Back to Romans chapter 2. Verse 
That was the word. Now here's the spirit. Verse 28. Romans 2, verse 28. At the end of every service, there's going to be a gospel call, hopefully. And you're going to, and the gospel demands a response. And you and I are called to believe in the gospel. You'll hear Steve do it. Every, uh, that's what I, one of the things I love about Steve. I don't care where he's got, where he's at, he's going to the gospel. You can't believe unless the Lord changes your heart. Now, you're responsible to believe, but until the Lord quickens you, until he gives you the spiritual apparatus to hear and respond, you will not believe. You can walk an aisle, you can pray a prayer, and if you wake up the next day and you're exactly the same, you haven't had a circumcised heart. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew, talking about a true believer, that's how he's using the term here, who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. He's talking about male boys being circumcised on the eighth day with a scalpel, a brisk or whatever they call it. But he is a Jew, verse 29, who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, not by the letter and his praise is not from men, but from God. The word goes out, and those whom God has elected to salvation before the foundation of the world, at a point in time, the Lord changes them with his spirit. It's Ezekiel 36. We don't have time to go there. It's verses 26 and 27. I'm going to put a new spirit within you. I, you're going to be careful to observe this change. I'm doing this for my glory because you've profaned my name amongst the Gentiles where you have went. Go back to John 6. This is what the church sor sorely needs. It says in the paragraph, Jesus, the Lord Jesus calls out of the world unto himself through the ministry of his word by his spirit those that were given unto him by his father. John 6, 33. All that the father gives me shall come to me and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. It's all through John's gospel. All right, paragraph six. We could, we could end there and keep going, but let's go to paragraph six. The members of these churches are saints, holy ones. The members of these churches are saints by calling, by God's calling, visibly manifesting and evidence in and by their profession and walking, their obedience unto the call of Christ and do willingly consent to walk together according to the appointment of Christ, giving up themselves to the Lord and one to another by the will of God in professed subjection to the ordinances of the gospel. That's what the church is to do. Go to Romans 1. We're going to go through these verses quickly because there's a point that needs to be made. Romans 1, verse 6. Kent's got 67 verses, so I can't go long today. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 6. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Paul is writing this letter to the church, to the believers in Rome, among whom you also are the called 
of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, holy ones, that's where they get this from, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saints because God has made us saints. We are holy because when the, Lord, when the Father looks at us, he sees the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has set us apart. He has dedicated us through the cross to himself. 1 Corinthians 2. Same concept. It's so interesting when Paul starts these letters that he is, he is talking about what God has done for him and what God has done for the people that he's writing to. Paul, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He didn't take it upon himself. He, he did, remember, he was, going, he was going to Damascus with other intent. And Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Jesus Christ, saints by calling, there it is, with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord. Acts chapter 2. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. This is how the church is to act. So then, Acts 2, 41. So then, those who had received his word, Peter's word, were baptized. Received meaning they had received it in belief. They have faith. They've received his word, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is what? The Lord Jesus Christ, it's the New Testament which would, what would become the New Testament, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And, and here's the point. This is the local body. This is, what, this is what the Lord has called us to. And all those who had believed, that word is faith, the, the main root there is the same word as faith, were together and had all things in common. Matt said it last week or several weeks ago, the thing that ties you and I together is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the tie that binds us together. Have you ever met a believer that you've never met before and you have a conversation and it's almost as if your hearts are resonating together it's, it's almost like a tuning fork, how you meet somebody and you've never met them before, and the Lord opens this conversation, you walk away and you go, wow. Ananias and Sapphira, chapter 5, lied about the price of the land. They both dropped dead. Verse 11, and, there, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord. There's a unity. They were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest, the non-believers, the people around them, the community around them, dared to associate them. However, the people held them in high esteem. That's, we should be united. We should care for each other. And even if the world doesn't understand, the world should look at us and say, wow, this is how they love each other. There's something different about them. This is the, this is the main point. 
So much in the church could be solved if we just understood this. This is, you know, we can go to, we can go to Romans 10, go to Romans 10 later, verses 23 through 26. Do not forsaking the gathering together. It's for encouragement. It's for edification. It builds us up. It convicts, it corrects, and it builds us up. That's why we come to church. It's an encouragement. You know, what, what's, I didn't understand this for years. At the end, I thought that the gospel call for many years was for the unbeliever. I believed in the gospel. I, I really, I was good. But it's like taking the Lord's Supper. When you hear the gospel, the gospel is for believers. It's a blessing to the believer to remember what God has done for you, what he has done for me. So much in the church, we get sideways in the church. I, I read the, we went to the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Talked about the humility of Abraham. We talked about the humility of Moses. We talked about the humility of Paul. Where we get sideways as a people, as a church, is when we start looking at ourselves instead of looking at God. When we personally get offended. When we want to exercise our American constitutional rights. You can't do that to me. And, and it creates frictions and factions. And Paul, is, Paul gives us the ultimate example in Philippians 1 and Philippians 2, and this is where I want to end. Go to Philippians 1, verse 27. This is so easy for me to say. I'm not good at practicing this. It's a struggle. It's hard. Because I want, there, there are times where I want it to always be about me. Can you relate? Verse 27, Philippians 1, 27. Only conduct, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I, Paul, come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Did you catch what he said in verse 27? That I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, in unity, and with one mind, striving together. It, it, it pictures pulling in the same direction. Why? What's the, for the faith of the gospel. Chapter 2, the theme continues. Verse 1, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in Spirit, intent on one purpose. That should, that, the world should look at us, and this should be what they see. So then he gives a practical lesson in how to do this. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. How do you do it? That's how you do it. Consider others better than yourself. Do not, verse 4, merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interest of others. And then we've gone from Abraham, we've gone from Moses, we've gone from Paul. Paul throws down the ace of spades. He, he throws down the trump card. He throws down the winning card. 
He brings the Lord Jesus Christ to the witness stand. Have this attitude in yourselves, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of flesh, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The ultimate example of humility is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember at the, he, he takes off his robe, he girds himself with a towel, the dress of a slave, and he washes their feet. This is the creator of the world. This is the sovereign. Not only is he our savior, he's our example. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us a unity of spirit, a unity of mind, that, Lord, we would look at ourselves and realize it's not about us, but it's about you. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of our sin, and that you would forgive us of our selfish agenda, and that we would truly consider others better than ourselves. I pray that you help us do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we are your people because you and not us has made us your people. Bless Kent, bless the next hour. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen.